Uh, thank you for coming. It's a beautiful, nice, warm spring night for a town meeting. Uh, I'm Mike Wisterman, your rookie town moderator. Uh, I'll, do, I'll do my best. We'll see if you're clapping when we're done. Um, I'll do my best to uh, stay on track here. Um, I have Wendy, my secret weapon, on the right side of me to help me get through some bumps if we have any. Um, I want to start by having the people on my right, your left, introduce themselves, please. I'm Frank Kevitz, North Sunderland. Uh, Scott Bergeron, <laughs> Old Amherst Road. Dave Pierce, uh, Howard Hepburn Drive. Sherry Patch, Elliot Crow. Finance chair. Uh, Bruce Bennett, North Main Street. Bill Power, South Main Street. Okay, and next, the members of the school com schools could please stand. We have a mic here. Greg Gottschalk, uh, school committee chair. Judy Hall, business manager. George Lanitas, principal of Frontier Regional. Darius Modesto, Superintendent. Ben Barshevsky, Principal, Sunderland Elementary School. Thank you. Please, I have a, uh, a letter that I'd like to uh, read that was, uh, um, I, I spoke with our recently elected uh, representative in the uh, state representative, uh, Natalie Blay. She has the following to say, good evening Sunderland residents, I apologize for not being able to attend town meeting this evening. After arriving home last, last night at 11 p.m. from a long budget week in Boston, I got on the road this morning at 7 a.m. to drive to Wilmington, Delaware, as I was invited to attend a conference on how to best to advance broadband in rural areas, and I could not pass up that opportunity. As many of you know, eight of the nine communities of the 1st Franklin District still lack broadband service. While I'd very much like to be with you tonight, I hope you all understand. My sincerest thanks to Tom, David, and Scott for their public service to Sunderland as our selectmen and to all of you serving on boards and committees. Thanks also to our town employees for your dedication to our community. You make our town work and of course this town meeting would not run as smoothly as it does without the tireless efforts of Sherry Patch and Wendy Houle. Finally, I want to acknowledge Mike Wisman for stepping up to take on the role of town moderator. <laughs> <laughs> I am confident that you will do an excellent job this evening. You, my friend, were born for this role. <laughs> I guess Natalie's a little out of touch with Mike. But no. I wish you all the very best for a productive town meeting tonight. And again, thank you for being there and for participating in our local government. My apologies for not being there in person. I'll be thinking of you all. Sincerely, Natalie. The reading of the warrant. Wait a minute. Yes. My specs. Thank you. Pursuant to within warrant, I have notified and warned the inhabitants of the town of Sunderland by posting up attested copies of the same at the town office building, the Sunderland Public Library, the Sunderland Post Office, seven days at least before the date hereof, as, in, as within directed, Frederick A. Laurinaitis, April 17, 2019, at 12.34 p.m. Thank you. I will now entertain a motion to dispense with a reading of motions. Move. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That's unanimous. Um, I'm also um, want you to know that I will exercise my right to declare a, a two-thirds vote. Um, as I have to make sure I have my wording right here, <laughs> that something I can declare a vote passes by a two-thirds vote. 
Um, if there's anyone who is opposed to that, take seven of you to be opposed to it, and then it can um, become a standing vote. Understood? Let's see. Next, I need to swear in the tellers in case there is a, a standing vote or a paper ballot. So could Steve Benjamin, Rob Powell, Liz Sillen, and Lauren Starr please come forward to get sworn in? Good. Just trying to, keep, trying to keep track of my. There we go. Now I'm back on. So next, um, the town report has come out. And as usual, um, there is a dedication of the town report, and there's also a spirit of Sunderland um, acknowledgement. And this year, the dedication is to Marianne Kowalik, who has been an elected member of the Board of Assessors since 1990. Um, she has served in many other capacities. She's worked part-time in the assessor's clerk for many years, providing assessing assistance to residents. Also as part of her elected position, she represented the Board of Assessors on the Permanent Building Committee and the EO 418 Economic Development Committee. She worked for many years on the vo uh, Volume 3 Steering Committee, which produced the latest edition of the History of Sunderland. Marianne also worked as an auditor in the 1960s, which is a position now known as the accountant. She has served as an election officer under the direction of the town clerk. Marianne has also been part of the 1998 Town Center Committee and enjoyed working on the 250th Anniversary Celebration Committee, which took place over 50 years ago. She has seen the town grow and evolve to what it is today. It also appears that Marianne loves serving our town in many ways. She could lend her talents or expertise. We appreciate her service and sincerely thank you for your continued commitment to our community. Hopefully she's watching from home and heard that. Next is the Spirit of Sunderland Award, which goes to the 300th Anniversary Celebration Committee. Well, we receive lots of ideas for community and many interested in offering their talents, time, and expertise to make this event our own. A committee was formed with members Cindy Benjamin, Amanda Hanley, Brenda and Mike Wozniakiewicz, Gail Drake, Thompson, Janet Conley, Tom Feidnikiewicz, and Tina Miller, Vinny Grandomico, and Tom Zimnoski. They were tasked with gathering ideas and needs to pull this celebration, celebratory year off. Many questions were asked, what kinds of events we should have, how this activity, how, how can this, whoops, I gotta get my glasses on. This isn't smaller print than the other one. Um, once our anniversary year grew closer, the committee moved into high gear to finalize all the great ideas the folks had. It was soon realized that the subcommittees for all the events were greatly needed, and once again, the town received a lot of support from local and neighboring businesses and residents. The state with the assistance of our legislatures and from communities that were held these great events before us. As you will see from our special anniversary section, the core committee with all the subcommittees highlighted in our event section, because there were too many to name here, provided the town with memories that will last a lifetime. We welcome those who came back to bask in the memories of yesteryear with us. Thank you for your commitment and hard work to make this a wonderful event for our community in the true spirit of Sunderland. Happy birthday. So in keeping with that, Tom Zimnoski is here, I think. There he is. Tom, step on up. And 
Tom's going to give us a final wrap up. Give it a second. There it is. Well, I've only been allowed, allotted three minutes at the most by Mr. Moderator. So anyways, here I go. Uh, I think you remember a few years ago I was up in front, probably was standing in the same location, taking and asking for money and support for our 300th anniversary. Um, according to uh, our moderator, he says you're limited to three minutes now. So here it goes. Uh, first of all, I am I'm pleased, honored, and thank you for the award for the Spirit of Sutherland to the entire 300th anniversary committee. They worked, we all worked very hard, and I think the end product was exceptional. I'd like to state and start by saying a huge thank you to the members that we've been dealing with for the last three years on the th anniversary committee. Our committee mission was directed by you, the citizens of Sunderland, uh, from the two focus groups that were held uh, over three years ago. The goals were set from what you wanted. We took on the challenge, many of the committee members, remember the town's 250th. From experiencing that celebration, we knew right from the, bar, right from the start that the bar at that time was set very high. Our memories and expertise, and it was just a wonderful celebration that we still remember. We had come up with a budget for funding. Has anyone here ever tried to take and budget a 300th town anniversary celebration? Anyone? Anyone else? Okay. Well, the committee came up with about $120,000. That's what we figured. All right. We were shot down. We took and cut a, took a budget cut. Our budget was set at town meeting at about $68,000. Planning the numerous events, we figured that it would take seven days thro spread throughout the year, not a three-day weekend event like the they had for the, the 250th. Fundraising began immediately. Listed in the report are some of the events we focused on to raise awareness and also funds. And also the community members that came up and stood and said, we want to take and do this, we want to take and do that. And for one of the, the items was just a street cleanup by Justine. Uh, uh, by Justine, she coordinated it, she did that and it cleaned up the town a little bit. We thank you very much for those little things that added to the event. So now for some details. I'll let you know that at the end of our celebration, I have the printout here, we spent uh, $104,000. To keep it short, Mr. Moderator, and to the town citizens here, these are some of the highlights. Flip the page, please. The, the parade subcommittee, they raised $30,150. The parade cost $28,496. Throughout the celebration year, in-kind services uh, support throughout the celebration year was well over $10,000 in you know, um, people coming forward, doing their thing, and not billing us for. Donations from area businesses, families, groups, individuals, coffee can collections, leaf collections, state and local grants, souvenir sales, the list can go on and on. So here it comes. Deep breath now, everyone. I stand here tonight and not ask for any money to cover our debt. You can all breathe now as I do. We will be returning to the town of Sunderland $52,351.56. Seven days of community center events cost the town about $16,000 and three years of our lives. Uh, so any, uh, are there any members, uh, Vinny, I see, uh, are any members of the 300 committee here beside me and Vinny, I see, or whatever like that, but anyways, here we are, and I think we stand proud at what we accomplished. And um, now a brief message to the future, 350th anniversary committee. Now this is a 350th. We now have set the bar high, and even higher. And it's their goal to take and raise it even higher. I want to take and thank you, Mr. Moderator. I think this came in in about three minutes, correct? You were kind of close. Okay, yeah. very yeah. good. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Tom. Okay, before we're just about to get started, a couple of things. Um, if you do have a question or a comment, please use the microphones. Um, this, the acoustics in here are horrible, and they're even worse up here, and they're even worse when your hearing's not that great. So um, please use the microphones, and uh, when you do come up,
clearly state your name and perhaps your address. I don't know if that's necessary, but your name so we understand who you are and, um, and keep your comments short and to the point and uh, speak clearly. I think that's it. Uh, and that's right. Keep your questions short or otherwise. Okay. So I think we're ready to go. Article 1. Mr. Moderator, I'd like to move Article 1, please. Second. Are there any discussion on Article 1? Article 1 is just so we get to uh, read the reports that everybody put in the annual report, sir. Everybody in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That's unanimous. Article 2. Mr. I'd like to move Article 2. Second. Our, article 2 is uh, showing you how much, this is the reason we're up here, is because we get paid so much money. So um, this is just a motion to pay for the town positions. Any, any, any questions or comments? All those in favor of Article 2? Aye. All those opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. Article 3, which is the budget, um, do we have a motion on Article 3? A motion for Article 3. Second. Now, the way we approach Article 3 is, um, I'll do the same as, as Bob Doobie did, which we'll go through section by section, and we'll put holds if you have any questions on a particular section. So everyone should hopefully have the sheet and you'll see that it's broken down into sections and I will read out the section and you just simply, somebody states hold and we'll come back and review it at which point you'll have a chance to ask whatever your question or concern is. So we'll start with uh, general government. Are there any holds on general government? None. Town buildings. Any holds on town buildings? The police department. Any hold on the police department? Any questions about their budget? Okay, hold on, police department. Fire department. Any questions about the fire department budget? None. Total inspectors and other protection. Any holds on their budget? None. Total highway. Any questions on the highway department budget? None. Total health and sanitation. Any questions on total health and sanitation for the town on their budget? The library. Any holes on the library budget? None. Elementary school. Any holes on the elementary school budget? I have a hold. The total Franklin County Tech Assessment, any holds on that? A hold on that. Total Frontier Assessment, any holds on the Total Frontier Assessment? None. Out of District Tuition and Transportation, any questions on that budget? There's a hold on that. Total benefits and insurance. Any questions on total benefits or insurance? 
None. Total miscellaneous and reserve fund. Any questions on that? None. Total wa wastewater treatment budget. Any questions on that? And total debt and interest. Any questions on that? None. Okay. So we have a hold on the police department. Who had a question on the police department? There we go. Jennifer. Very minor. I just don't understand the negative 22,000. It seems like it should be a positive. Did you hear that question? Try it again. The change from FY20 final has a negative 22,702. It seems like it should be a positive number. That's all. It's a sign problem. We're, we're checking to make sure the handout sheet total value is correct, and it looks like it is correct. You happen to have a minus. We almost, almost cut the police 22,000, but thank you. <laughs> I said thank you for the pickup. It's, it, the numbers are correct. The grand total of the budget also is correct. Nice catch, Jennifer. Uh, Mike, don't want any fake news here. How do we know that that's a plus 22,702? How do we know it? that it balances out at the bottom? If I could, Mr. Moderator, we've got the detailed budget as well. The summary it didn't transfer. The detailed budget, the numbers line up completely. So the 22,000 is an increase, and the total budget number that you see on the summary is equal to the budget that was voted by the board and the finance committee. But thanks for checking. If you also look on your detail, you can see the change from FY19 to FY20. It goes up by exactly $22,702. Okay. Okay, the next hold we have is on the elementary school. Who had a question? Peter. It's working? Okay. Hi, I'm Peter Gagarin, uh, 300 North Main Street. Uh, I'm a member of the school committee, and I just wanted to talk uh, briefly to a couple of points. Um, first one is, since last town meeting, we have a new superintendent of schools. He came in last June, uh, Darius Modesto. And I think many of you know him, but in case you don't, um, he was principal at Frontier before that, so he knows the district. Um, to put it simply, he's been terrific. Uh, he's smart, he's got good communication skills, he's got good people skills, he's got good judgment. We're lucky to have him. Thank you, Darius. I hope I haven't embarrassed you, but it's actually true. You, you, you've been great. Um, and I should say that there was, you know, you, you, you make judgments, I make my own judgments when you see people in action. and. There was one point just at the end of last fiscal year when we were trying to close out the books and it turned out we had a bad number and I had heard about it one afternoon just by chance and honest to goodness, I said to myself, I wonder how long it's gonna take before they let the school committee know. Early the next morning, I got an email from Darius, okay, spelling out exactly what was like my dream email from a superintendent basically saying we found this problem we've already dealing with it I just want to let you know because that's what I'm supposed to do and you know you need to be informed and it was like this guy is gold okay and it's it's been great and I look forward to it um, the second point is 
addresses the budget. Uh, and the school is the biggest uh, part of the budget. Uh, it's also the biggest billing in town. There's the most going on. It's in use all the time. Um, and so I thought I should just say a little something about uh, this year's budget and this year's situation. Um, one of my goals on the school committee is that we uh, communicate well with and work closely with the town side of government. It's not true in a lot of towns, but it's certainly something in this town we try and do. Uh, and we have a great town government. I've said this before, and I continue to feel that. Um, the select board, all the folks that work in town hall, the various town departments, all the committees, including the finance committee that's sitting up there. This town really is special. As the years go by, I believe that more than ever. Okay, I've come to a lot of these town meetings, and I just am impressed every year by how lucky we are. And a whole lot of us are involved. I imagine a whole lot of us in this room, in one way or another, are involved in making this town work. Okay, so it's our town in more ways than one. One, one more minute, Peter, one more minute. This is very big type, so it's gonna go quickly. Okay, communicating ought to be easy, but you still have to work at it. This has been a difficult budget to put together, but that's nothing new. They always seem to be hard. They're always hard choices to be made. But there has been good communication. Selectmen and finance have been at our meetings. We've been to theirs. We keep in touch outside of meetings just so there are no surprises. I think this is how government is supposed to work, and they are all strong supporters of the school. The budget before us tonight, recommended by the school committee, is also recommended unanimously by the select board and finance committee. The increase appears to be really high, but what is going on that is not there is the fact that the amount of school choice money that we can use for this year's budget has dropped significantly, okay? And therefore, more of the burden has to ship, shift to the town side. The actual budget that we're working with the only thing that we've added is having to add one more teacher because our sixth grade that is aging out has only one class and the grade coming in has two classes. Okay. Um, so that's, you know, here we are. This, you know, we have this budget in front of us. But passing this budget is actually a two-step process. Step one is tonight at annual town meeting. Okay. Step two is next Saturday a week from tomorrow at the town election where an override is on the ballot. If that does not pass, we'll be back here trying to figure out what to cut. So I just say, please vote yes next Saturday and help us, help us keep this a great town and the great school that it is. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Bruce. Uh, Bruce Bennett, North Main Street. I'd just like to add to what Peter says. Uh, I've been on a finance committee for a number of years, a selectman before that. This is the first time in a long time I've felt comfortable working with the school administration and getting a budget passed. Um, I, I think they work very well with the town, and uh, they've been very forthcoming with issues within the school to help us plan into the future. I'd just like to thank you for being so cooperative. Let's see, uh, Greg Gottschalk, 10 Reservoir Road, uh, and I'm also the, the chair of the school committee. Uh, a lot of the stuff that I was looking to say has already been said, so I'll be able to keep this brief. Um, I just want to talk about what's at stake and what kind of a school we have here. Um, I think of it like uh, different approaches to maintaining your car. You know, some people, they may spend a lot, uh, get only factory parts, you know. Uh, other people, they may, uh, defer maintenance here and there, but still maintain their vehicles pretty well, and then some people run to failure. Uh, and this school is, it's right on that edge between, uh, we, we get the budget passed, the, our principal and the whole team at the school does a phenomenal job pitching in, keeping costs low, keeping kids with uh, special needs in district. Um, everybody's busy, the salaries aren't extravagant, the materials aren't extravagant, 
this budget was already a, a challenge when it first came in, um, and it took a long time. Uh, let me put it this way: for a number of years, the amount of money that uh, has been available from school choice, instead of being spent a year after it's brought in, uh, is being spent the same year that it's coming in. So. It's, that, it's the same thing as the, the car maintenance. If you have a lot of money in the bank, then if you get a surprise bill, it's no big deal. But, or if you have a rich uncle or rich grandparents, it's no big deal. Uh, the state and the feds have been stepping back from education over the same period of time. So it really is up to the town to, to unfortunately foot the bill for the, uh, the school. And uh, this looks like a big increase, but what it actually is is as the town population grows, the amount of seats available for choice go away, and then uh, it's the kids in town who are filling up the chairs. And so what may seem like a big step up is actually sort of the end of a discount, right? So uh, it's not as if there's a great big surge in cost this year. It's more that the, some of the choice money that's been defraying our costs are going away. And if we don't pass the override, you're going to see big cuts to programs, and you may also see uh, kids choicing and chartering out, which is going to be a whole problem next year where you've got to foot the bill for that, and you don't even have a school committee to watch those, uh, those expenses. The bill for the choice and charter goes straight to the town without any oversight from the town itself. So uh, this isn't just a year to get out and vote like Peter was talking about. It's a year to tell your friends to get out and vote because it can be a really ugly situation if this doesn't pass. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Mr. Moderator, last, last Friday evening I had the, uh, um, I was invited by Representative Blay to meet with the Senate and House Vice Chairs of the Education Committee and Joint Committee in Northampton. And there were people all across Senator Comerford's area that was there. At this time, just, just so you know, this is actually not speaking about the budget, but according to all the, the legislators and senators that were in that room, we, we are facing a generational opportunity to change the way education is funded. I would highly recommend that if you are interested, um, concerned, um, and a lot of other adjectives about the way education is funded, now is an opportunity to become involved because things will change. And, and hopefully they will be for the better for small rural communities like ourselves. But for instance, uh, a gentleman from Conway would, uh, spoke and about, talked about how the addition of one or two people that came into their town ended up causing them a shift of $200,000 on their budget. That has happened to Sunderland before. It, not this year, but it has happened in the very recent past. So I would highly recommend to become involved and, and listen and pay attention to what's happening in Boston on education right now, because the only one they're going to listen to are, is the people if we speak in one voice. And, and our voice needs to be strong, and that, they, that we need to look at funding on rural communities like ourselves in, in Conway and Shelburne and Charlemont and Heath and Monroe and all the rest of the towns. So I would just ask that everybody pay attention to what's happening in Boston for the next year or two uh, what's concerning funding of education. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Yes. Hello, hello again, Darius Modesto, Superintendent. I just wanted to be clear that this budget is bare bones coming to this number. And that we have already frozen all unessential accounts for the second half of the school year once we realized we were in this situation. Um, uh, ben Barshevsky, your principal, has um, all cut cuts, all costs, so that we could save money this year to make this number as low as where it's at now. Um, we've already cut instructional assistance. We've cut Spanish. We've cut um, occupational therapy from full-time to 0.8. We've taken the food service uh, salary that was in the local budget 
and we've moved it to, be, to fund itself because been, we've had a nice turnaround with the new food servicing that we put in last year. Um, we've taken money grants in SPED that usually go to other things to knock down this cost. Um, we've taken mo money from Early Childhood's Revolving Fund to knock down this cost. We've frozen the computer line item to replace all the library computers around $20,000 to cut down this cost. Okay? Um, we cut custodial, custodial temp services, meaning that if we had a custodial out for a long period of time, we need to bring temporary in. We cut that. Um, and we're also, we have a, uh, another grant that we're reconfiguring for next year so, to help cut the cost. So it, I'm being very clear that if this override does not go through and we don't have this budget and we got to come back and cut more, it's, there's nothing, there's no fluff left. Okay, there'll be, there'll be, it'll be programs, um, it'll be extra help in the classrooms because um, the state and the laws mandate that we do certain things. So, and there's certain things that aren't mandated. And unfortunately, the things that make a wonderful school community, such as your arts and your musics and those kind of things, um, aren't the things that are mandated. Special education is mandated. Um, and, um, you know, your, obviously your regular classroom things are mandated. So I just want to make sure that people really understand that, um, you know, we, I've worked closely. Um, with both boards, and I want to thank them. Um, this has been a difficult year. Um, this time we got here was difficult because we relied on a funding source that really shouldn't have been relied on this way. And um, you know, school choice was not meant to be a revenue source. It was supposed to be something extra. And this town needed it to be a revenue source years ago. And we, signed up, we went too far with it, and now we've got to pull back. So the savings that you've done the last five years of not increasing your budget and using this it's, you're kind of getting a bill at the end, is how I, I see it. Ben, did I miss anything within that? No, I think you covered it all, but just uh, we have an increasing enrollment, in-town enrollment here at Sunderland. Uh, this is my sixth year right now. Um, going into next year's budget cycle, we will have added four additional classroom teachers and one special education teacher. So each year we've had one sixth grade class going out and two kindergarten classes coming in. Um, and we're looking at that again in a couple of years. So in 2020, 21, we'll probably be having the same discussion as we hit. We'll have one fifth grade class next year. And that will be the only section pre-K through six that has one classroom. Any other comments or questions? Susan? I just wonder if um, the superintendent or principal has a line item on the cost of standardized testing and MCAS and all the rest of that. As a retired school teacher, I know a lot of resource goes into it, and I just wonder if there is a line item for it. Uh, there's not a line item. It comes from the state for standardized testing. Th there's not a line item that's in the local budget that go goes towards standardized testing, if that's what you're asking. I'm a little unclear. Uh, comes out of DESE, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Anyone else? Hi. Uh, Jennifer Uncles, uh, North Silver Lane. I just feel compelled to share a piece of our personal history with the school that we love so much. Um, my son was born in 2007, which means he started that part-day preschool right after the big override. And we had a lot of friends that moved out of town from preschool to kindergarten to first grade. We're now the sixth grade class. It's only a one class grade moving up to Frontier. And um, kindergarten was a little bit of a rough year because you have kids that are starting school that haven't been in a school structure before. And uh, I believe that uh, our class is one of the reasons for the Horizons program because we need to meet the needs of all our students. 
Um, any human being would go that way, I think. Um, and I would hate to see that cycle begin again. We got to benefit from the re renewing of all the programs that happened as time went on. I witnessed our school budget single-digit increases over the years while other parts of the town budget hit double-digit increases in percent-wise. And now's the time for us to pick up that, like the superintendent said, the bill that comes later on and keep it going forward. And I do believe that more than 200000 is needed, but I'll go for that at least. Um, so keep our school where it is. I, I'm fully in support of that override to keep our school the great school that it is. Yes. Jessica Corwin, North Silver Lane. I'm a parent at Sunderland Elementary, and I just wanted to say a word on behalf of the teachers. We have the 12th lowest teachers, no, sorry, the seventh lowest teacher salaries in the state out of 351 towns. Um, we also only cover 60% of town employee health insurance. The area average is 75%. We have an amazing teaching staff in spite of that. If the override doesn't pass and more cuts need to be made, it will be impacting those teachers. And I would be expecting to see more turnover, more attrition in our teaching staff, which would really hurt the sense of community that we have here. Thank you. Anyone else? Bob? Hold on, Bob. Hold on. You know the rules, Bob. You know the rules. <laughs> Bob Doobie, South Plain Road. Uh, I was wondering what the average class, you can't hear? You're good. Oh, okay. I was just wondering what the average class size is and how much class size is driven by uh, school choice students coming in. Our class sizes range from 15 to 22 students. We've always used school choice to fill a section, and but never create a section. Uh, we've capped our numbers for the early elementary school grades for K through two at 18, and for three through six at 20. Um, so we don't look to take any school choice students past those numbers. Anyone else? Lauren, right over here. Uh, Lauren Star South Main Street. I just wanted to point out that uh, while the budget issue is primarily with the school, if we don't pass this override, this, the, but the resulting budget cuts will affect the town across the board. So it's a problem in all town departments looming. Thank you. We're keeping you moving. Hello, my name is Manuel Pintado. I'm a resident of 240 Amherst Road. This, uh, I think this is my first time being here. I've been here to, uh, a couple of times. And um, thank you, everybody. Thank you uh, to the town council and everybody for doing a great job. And thank you to the, um, the school um, superintendent. But I, know, I have a question. I don't know how much of a Latino community lives in here in Sunderland. I, I'm a graduate from UMass. I know a little bit what's happening in Amherst, but I don't know over here. But after you, you said that there's going to be no, no Spanish, what's going to happen with this, some of the people that, because there was a lot of people that came from Puerto Rico because of the hurricane. Is there any way that it's going to affect? Because if it does, I think we all got to be there on Saturday and pass this over, right? Thank you. That's a very good question, a very good point. And uh, first, we don't like cutting absolutely anything at all. Um, the way the Spanish model has worked, and we've had Spanish here for a few years, um, Spanish was in the budget for one day a week, and we tr tried to provide each class K through six with um, Spanish one day a week. 
as the class, uh, as the school size grew and we added sections, the time from Spanish went from 30 minutes once a week down to 25. And then when it started to grow again, we changed it to a quarterly model. So some students this year had Spanish in the first and third quarters of the school year, and other classes had Spanish from in quarters two and four. Again, once a week, only 25 to 30 minutes. Um, as far as uh, it impacting um, uh, families who uh, are from the Latino community, we're making sure we're reaching out um, to all the uh, diverse ethnic groups that we have in our school in other ways. Um, and I'd be happy to talk about that with you at some point um, another time. I just wanted to clarify that if we have students that do come in with us, English as a second language, we do provide tutoring and that kind of thing that's not connected to the Spanish program. So, um, and we have a large variety. Um, Sunderland's the most diverse um, community in the um, Frontier District, if we'll call it the, the four towns. Um, and do you know the, the variety of tutors you have? Yeah. We'll have spent close to $20,000 this year providing tutoring services, including Spanish, uh, Punjabi, Turkish, Japanese, and Chinese. Any other questions on the elementary school portion of the budget? Okay, thank you. The next hold was on the total Franklin County Tech Assessment. Who had a question on that? Liz. Hi, uh, Liz Sillen, South Main Street. This is hardly a complaint, but I'm just noticing that there's a, a wide variety uh, in the amounts for the last three years. Usually it's based on population, I think, and it just seems odd for a four-year school to have such wild swings over the last three years, and I just wondered if there was more to the story. Is the Franklin County Tech rep here? No. Oh, Jim, hold on. In the absence of uh, anybody else from Franklin County Tech, I'll try to handle this. Um, I'm on the Franklin County Tech School Committee, and the fluctuations that you see in the cost are based solely on the uh, amount of students that are coming from Sunderland going to Franklin County Tech. So as new ones come in as freshmen and old ones graduate, the numbers fluctuate from one year to another based on attendance. Some years, if you have 10 freshmen coming in and six seniors graduating, you have four additional students. Thank you. Any other questions on the tech assessment? All right. The next hold was out of district tuition and transportation. Who had a question on that? Susan. Susan Triolo, um, Garage Road. Uh, I, I, it's just a question um, about, um, and I, I think it might have already been answered about the number of kids that are being sourced out of the school district or children coming into the district. Is that what this has to do with? It's an increase of 8%. Sorry, the, that is the trans, the frontiers assessments to towns are broken up by the cost of running the school, and then we break out transportation separately. This year, we uh, we redid our contract, um, our busing contract, and Frontier took, and that is the the growth of Frontier's budget is almost uh, the majority of that growth is because of transportation adjustment to the new contract. However, the contract. Um, the contractor, Gripco, Gripco um, Transportation, what he did in his contract is he put 
all the growth on Frontier and none on the elementary schools. And the reason for that, and it's actually kind of clever on that part, is that we get, we get reimbursement from the state for transportation for the region, not for the towns. And so by doing that, he was able, and he still came in far lower than our neighbors to the north who also went out to contract this year. We, have a, we got a very good contract from him. But the, that's why the growth is happening from Frontier and not in your elementary budget. Your elementary budget did, had no growth for transportation. In fact, it went down slightly. So um, that's kind of just how it kind of, we move the numbers around. So the assessment is the same um, because, you know, you, you're running off the Frontier assessment model. So... Um, based on your enrollment of five-year average. So I hope that answers. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, you, had, you had also mentioned uh, tuition in students um, in and out. And I'm, and I'm proud to say that although, although we do have students, some students choosing out of Sunderland, we have no students who are tuitioned out. So that means our students with high needs are educated here in this very own building. Um, and I'm very proud of our faculty and staff who do an exceptional job. Thank you. Any other questions on the budget? That means we are ready to vote. I appreciate all the comments and questions this is a big, big item. In some years, we breeze right through it with hardly a question. So it's actually nice to hear people understanding that we're about to spend a lot of money. So the total amount of the budget is eight million five hundred sixty-four thousand nine hundred and two dollars. So all those in favor of Article Three, please say aye. All those opposed, I declare it unanimous. Thank you. <laughs> Article 4. Mr. Moderator, I've got a number 4, please. Article 4. You make the motion, Tom? Second. Motion. And you second it, Scott. And I second. Good at, job. Good at, job. Well, you guys are new at this, so I understand. At, at this time, Mr. Moderator, I'd like to take no action on the article. You may have to pull out your book for that one. <laughs> so is that the requirement vote? Yeah. yeah. You do require a majority vote. Second. Okay. okay. So we're taking no action on this, but it does require a majority vote. All those in favor of taking no action on Article 4 say aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Nay? I declare that unanimous. Well, run smoothly. That was run smoothly. Okay, next. <laughs> A little curveball. Um, article 5. Moderator, let's move Article 5. Second. Explanation, please. Moderator, if I could, this is um, the value the selectmen are asking to have moved from our available free cash to fund the stabilization budget. If we were following our uh, procedure or policy from prior years, we would actually move a lot more money to capital stabilization. And if I could digress, the, art, the motion, excuse me, the article that we just uh, disposed of would have been the move to move money from available free cash to stabilization. Both of these two tacts are to allow for the use of the value of free cash that was in Article 3. So we're using a little more in the proposed Article 3 budget than our formula normally would allow. We're not putting money in stabilization this year, and we're not putting as much money in capital stabilization this year, driven primarily to keep our available revenues available in support of the long discussion we just had around Article 3 and its support of the elementary school. I would also say, Mr. Moderator, that this is the second year in a row that we've 
diverged from our historic percentages. And I would really like a normal budget season next year. Next year. Yeah, next year when you're still here. Next. Yeah. I have to get voted in. That's right. That may not happen. We'll see. Um, okay. So we have a article motion made and seconded. Any other comments on Article 5? Questions? Okay, all those in favor of Article 5, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Declare unanimous. Article 6. 6. An explanation, please. Uh, Mr. Moderator, the, the uh, town meeting has a handout. Sorry. Uh, there's a handout marked 20, FY20 capital budget. This article is in support of that budget. If everybody has that in front of them and can see uh, Article 6, uh, the value at the bottom is 200,168.48, representing the article. This process uh, is a parallel process to the operating budget where department heads uh, submit capital requests based, and they go through the Capital Improvement Committee and then through the Finance Committee and the Select Board and represented to this august body. We have uh, raised about $113,000 on the tax rate this year and are asking for, we just approved the $88,000 to fund this request. The original requests that came to the Capital Planning Committee were in excess of $380,000. And you can see on your sheet where those votes were either a yay, a nay, or a table. And our total request, if you look, we're, we're paying a truck lease for the highway department. We're uh, year three. There's a storage container as opposed to a building that the highway superintendent is asking for. At the library, the, there are some building envelope repairs and some building envelope, probably triennial work that's got to happen to keep the asset alive. So some masonry pointing, some power washing, and then uh, some HVAC uh, repairs we have appropriated in years past. And this money stays in capital stabilization until it's, until it's actually needed. So this HVAC repairs um, are something that is 14, 15 year old, almost, oh my God, 17 year old systems now, um, that on occasion need compressor replacements, et cetera, et cetera. We feel by definition that that's all capital it has a life a longer than 10 years, has a value greater than the, what we're going to vote in a future article. Um, moving down uh, a cruiser, it's like a cruiser a year, it seems, Chief. Cut it out. It's the cows. It's the cows, the right? Cows. Right? Striped Galways. <laughs> um, engineering for complete streets is our, our commitment to another phase of complete streets work, that's straight engineering money. And if you've been on the sidewalks in South Main Street, Garage Road, in and around the school, seen some of those improvements, this is our application for a next phase. The town clerk wants to make sure there isn't too much uh, election equipment problems, and this election equipment also allows for another site to be used. Uh, and then there is some siding and building repairs here at the elementary school that were called out by the district, by the uh, facilities manager, and also were part of our buildings assessment. Uh, and that's why you have a $200,168 uh, 200, I would also remind the body that this four years ago, five years ago, would have only been if free cash was available and we used it very differently. Um, these have become much more programmatic, and I'm... Uh, uh, frankly proud of that. I think I'm, I'm proud of the community for voting for what they did, installing a program, installing a committee, and making it so we can vote on these things once a year in a budget format, not in the crisis format. So, thank you. Okay, any other questions or comments on Article 6? Now, Article 6 is moving from capital stabilization, appropriating for capital stabilization. So this is a two-thirds majority vote. With that, does it require two-thirds? 
Yes, yes. So, two thirds. Uh, all those in favor of Article 6, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Declare it unanimous. Thank you. that the assistant town, uh, assistant town clerk take over for the town clerk? We need a second. Second. Need to be, need to be voted? Huh? Needs to be voted? Yes. Okay. Everyone in favor of having the assistant town clerk take over for the town clerk, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes unanimously. Thank you. Musical chairs. Okay, thank you for that. Ar Article 7, please. I move Article 7. Second. Explanation? Uh, Mr. Butter, these are, these are uh, a transportation fund that is required if we're going to use monies, in this case here, $528.50 to augment uh, some of our complete streets projects. So by having the fund available and then having the monies in there, basically it applies to, sorry, come this way. <laughs> You're way back there. That's okay. So uh, this transportation infrastructure fund is an output of the Complete Streets program. We have $528.50 in that. We want to be able to use that for some additional signage. It's very uh, specific to that Complete Streets. Any questions on that? Okay. All those in favor of Article 7, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Declare that unanimous. Thank you. Move Article 8, Mr. Moderator. Second. Second. Jennifer, you want to have an explanation, please? Jennifer Uncles, I'm on the Community Preservation Committee and the Conservation Commission. This is a dual presentation, I guess. So this is basically to appropriate a total of should be $80,000. Uh, I think, is that out of date? Yeah. To move from the Community Preservation Fund to the Conservation Trust for APR purposes. And this is because we are gunning for a certain piece of property up Route 47 uh, to put into APR. And we're waiting to hear if the USDA or the state APR program is going to provide the match beyond the town's portion, and the $80,000 would pretty much get our worst case scenario to cover, to make that priority farmland that's been in farmland for decades and excellent soils and all that to continue to be a farmland. Um, if, there, if we don't need all of that, then it'll stay there until there's another piece of APR worthy property for that purpose. Thank you. Any questions? Bob? The question I would have is what percentage does the $80,000 represent of the total purchase price of the parcel? It's almost 50% of the development value of that property. There's two properties together. We're hoping for the 10%, which is the 
state matching program, or the federal, if the federal, it takes longer with the federal program. The federal program would provide more money. The state would only do, would, we would have to provide more of a match. Uh, Susan had a question. This, this is up it, on, this it, is Gunn's property up on Route 47. So my, it's my pun that we're gunning for it. <laughs> Good question, Scott. No. Oh, I don't have the detail of the total size of the property on hand. Um, it's a lot of acres. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm trying to remember. <laughs> It's the parcel as you go up across from Gun Farm. There's a piece that goes up the hillside there. It includes that, and it also includes the, fee, uh, the piece out by Whitmore Crossroad. Um, so if I had to guess, it's maybe 50 acres? Up to between 50 and 70 acres. Somewhere in there. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Bruce? This is one of the best investments the town can make. Uh, that particular property has quite a bit of road frontage. Um, if someone were to go in there to develop it, it would mean a lot of houses, a lot of kids in the school, a lot of town services would be required. Agricultural land requires the least town services and has the least impact on the tax rate. And um, it, it's a nice piece of land up there. And uh, I, like I said, it's a, it's, it's a very, very good investment for the town for short money. Any other questions or comments? Just quick yes. comment. Uh, Sarah Snyder, Chair of the Community Preservation Committee. Just to clarify, we're required to spend 10% of our community preservation funds on, um, for open space. And um, we, uh, this is actually less... We, we've been collecting 10%. We've yet to spend. We've, we've spent very little on open space. And this is actually less than we've already reserved. So the, the funds are there. Um, we have more than that in reserve already for open space. Thank you. Uh, any other questions, comments on Article 8? Okay. All those in favor of Article 8, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. Number nine. Second. Mr. Moderator, if I could. I have no idea how these numbers come about. I've been a member of the Community Preservation Committee for a number of years. There's only two people in this world that understand that formula, and one of them's Jennifer. <laughs> And the other one's Brian, and the only thing, and Brian's the accountant. The only thing I know is Jennifer and Brian get into hours-long discussions about how these numbers come up. Jennifer, don't I don't know how agree. you, I don't know how you do it, Jennifer, but <laughs> but but she comes up with the night right numbers, and the state doesn't yell at us, so I'm really happy. <laughs> Basically, what it says is that the the state says that we have to have a portion of of our money that we receive from CP the CPC CPA money has to be in specific funds to make sure we're spending it correctly. Brian and Jennifer go through that and make sure that it's there, and that's the numbers that you see presented. Jennifer, thank you. Do you want to comment, Jennifer? No, thank you. It's really all Brian. Okay. Yeah, the rest of us on the committee, when they start talking, we all look at the ceiling, so... <laughs> Uh, any questions on Article 9? Okay. All those in favor of Article 9, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Yeah, unanimous. Thank you. Number 10. I move Article 10. I'll second. How's that, Mike? That was good, Tom. Okay. That was good, yeah. Um, this is basically setting the amount of money that we're allowing for different inspectors in town. Um, you want to explain the shared highway equipment? Uh, 
Ba basically, we, uh, on our construction, wiring inspections, plumbing inspection, board of health, uh, those are all fee for services. So the, the individuals that take those positions do those positions for um, the fees that they collect. And this just sets a maximum value for those fees and allows us to pay them. Yes, Scott, go ahead. If, I, if I could, the shared equipment, we share several pieces of equipment with different communities, and that's our contribution to that. I believe we have a bucket truck, we have an over-the-bank mower, we've got at least one other one that doesn't come immediately to mind. But that's our contribution to the multi-town as opposed to having one town buy an asset and another town buy the same asset. And so that's our contribution. Yep, that seems like a smart program. Any questions on Article 10? Bob, where's our mic man? Here he comes. Thank you. Looking at the values for the inspectors. Still not on, Bob. You've been waiting for all these years to sit down and staff. <laughs> but it's on. <laughs> oh, okay. There you go. Uh, there you go. Okay. Uh, looking at the the vet salaries of the inspectors, if you want to call them that, is that going to c cover the expenses associated with the development of Sugarbush Meadows? That seems like a very, very large project, and it's going to require multiple inspections, and I'm wondering how that's going to take place. Mr. Moderator, and that's a really good question. That is a sizable project, one that Sunderland hasn't seen in some years. Uh, built into the applicant's fee is the fee for inspectional services oversight. That's separate than this. So they are paying for those inspectors uh, to be there at the applicant, or in this case here, the developer's costs, not the town's. Good question. Any other questions on Article 10? Okay. Uh, all those in favor of Article 10, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Declare unanimous. Article 11. Uh, move Article 11. Second. Explanation? Uh, it's essentially our snow and ice. It's the one item that we're allowed to deficit spend, and it fluctuates, um, can fluctuate wildly each year, depending on how much snow and ice we get. So. And that's our cost for this year. So there, there is a line item allowance, right. but you exceed it, and this makes up the difference. Exactly. Right. Okay. Any questions on this Article 11? This is essentially covering our extra snow and ice expenses for the year beyond the, what was budgeted. Okay. Everyone in favor of Article 11, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Article 12. Move Article 12. Second. Uh, Mr. Moderator, if I could, Article 12 is one of the, sorry, here we go. Article 12 is one of the strategies that the elementary school uh, has asked the board and the, this body to employ to uh, reduce their operating expense. Essentially, this is the uh, one-time payout of retirement costs for uh, retiring one. Anyway, retiring staff. In years past, we've done this with multiple staff retirements, where if the board has felt and the finance committee has felt that it was a more appropriate use of uh, free cash, if it was available, versus baked into the recurring operating budget. And I. I frankly would implore to continue using this strategy in that this cost may not be there next year or it will be different or it may not be five years before someone retires. But this strategy, I think, is better for uh, the community as well as the elementary school. Any questions on Article 12? Okay. All those in favor of Article 12, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. To move Article 13. Second. Okay, you want a school committee explanation? So, um, what you have before you here is the 
A, a building committee was put together in December of 17 to look at the um, different areas of frontier that um, need repair, refurbishing, that kind of stuff that are larger than um, what can be done in the general budget. That committee, um, your members here were, were Judy Pierce and um, Scott Bergeron. Um, so we made a committee with a select board member and a school committee member from all four towns to look at this issue. So again, to create, create communication and transparency for what's going on at Frontier. Um, you know, Frontier is 21 years old since its last major renovation, and there's some, just some areas that need to be um, repaired. So what's coming in front of you t um, tonight is that the school committee is asking to borrow um, uh, 1.8 million um, and, and change um, to address these different areas of need, right? Now you're coming, you're probably looking at me saying you're the same year the elementary school budget is hurting, you're coming at us with this. The actual funds for this are not going to be, when you take out notes, um, you don't, you, you don't, when you, after you take them out, you have 12 months before you have to pay them. So we're actually, this may not actually reach the town under an assessment of debt from Frontier until the 2021 budget and maybe even the 2022 budget, depending on when these um, projects get, get going. They are a series of projects that will be different contractors, all which will have to go out to bid, um, all which are over $100,000. So that's why instead of coming at you with different warrants over the next five years, the idea was to, to go after a 10-year um, loan through a series of notes. When you talk about a series of notes, we're only going to borrow what we need for each project as we go through. Um, we have to go general estimates because you can't get bids on projects until you have the money to go out to bid. So we have these general, um, you know, the strong estimates um, from professionals, obviously. Um, but those numbers don't include um, looking at grants for energy reduction when you look at the HVAC project, you know, and other th kind of things in lighting and that kind of thing. So we'll be doing all those things within that. I, I did, there was a handout regarding this, hoping that answered some of the basic questions, but if there's any other direct questions about that, I'd be happy to answer. I also want to thank this committee that put this together. You know, administrator gets a mic, it's the worst thing. Um, because they, we also created a capital improvement plan that put in rules on how we're going to address the capital needs of Frontier moving forward. In the years past, as things came up, we brought it up. Now we're, we're looking to project ahead um, all the things coming down the pike um, with, with within capital needs. So more planning ahead so that we can better prepare and so forth and have rules around that so you can't just, if we ask for money for one thing, we can't go spending it on another. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Any other questions on Article 13? Dick Trousdall, South Main Street. Uh, I just wonder, the track cost $630,000 just for the track when everything else is just over a million, million two hundred thousand. Uh, is there a reason for that? So when we looked at the needs of Frontier um, in looking over the next 10 years, this is what we've chosen to borrow for. So there's actually other needs outside of this that we're going to get through general budget, through our own E&D, which is, you know, Frontier is basically, you look at it as its own town, it's the free cash of Frontier we have left over in a budget we call E&D, um, that we will be also be doing other projects. The cost of the track, um, it is a full, the underlayment beneath the rubber um, is, is, is deteriorated. We brought out um, a company to look at just relaying that rubber surface over it, and they will not guarantee it. So we're not going to spend half that on re, you know, it's just around 100, between 100 and 200 thousand dollars to relay the top of the track that wasn't going to be guaranteed. So what they're going to have to do is go down and replace the asphalt underneath, and then put the new track top topping on there. And it is that much money. Um, you know, if you want a full. We could also go for the 1.5 million, which would give us the full artificial surface in the middle, which a lot of schools are doing, but that was shot down. Uh, I know it's not a funny joke, but right. Um, so, but that, that is the cost of it. And um, track is one of the, uh, is the um, largest participation activity at Frontier. Um, we have over 200 athletes running track, and I see one that went to Michigan um, to run track. So, 
that's the parent, the proud parent of, of Ms. Miner here. Any other comments, questions, Article 13? Hello, Diane Gamer from Russell Street. The cost, I'm assuming, is the total cost, and so you need approval from all four towns to move forward? I need all four towns to say yes to allow Frontier to incur this debt, and then you will be assessed, another, another line item in your assessment to Frontier. Um, and we projected the 10-year assessment um, whenever we start to take the loan and provided that to the Finance Committee and Select Board so that they could see how it's going to be paid off over the 10 years. Your, your portion of it will be broken down following the Frontier Regional Agreement, which is based on your enrollment over a five-year rolling average. Does that answer your question? Yeah. So it, technically, it could be lower than this, because we're only going to borrow what we need. But we had to do you know, conservative numbers. And when we started these numbers, it's been, by the time we get it going, it's going to be two or three years. So most likely, things are going to go up. But we're going to do our best to keep that low. OK. Anyone else? Article 13. Oh, Aaron? <clears throat> Aaron Falbel, Amherst Road, and also member of the Energy Committee. And my question is regarding the HVAC upgrade that will be part of this measure. I believe all four towns that are part of the frontier communities have been designated as green communities. And if that HVAC upgrade entails energy savings, you would be qualified for green community grant status. And I'm wondering if you have looked into that possibility so as to defray the cost. Yes. So we are. Um, so we are looking. We're going to be looking into any grants, including energy, green energy grants, and, and so forth, when doing these repairs and, and modifications. Because um, again, this system is. We have upgrades along the way, but um, the system is over 20 years old, and a lot of um, improvements in energy efficiency has happened in HVAC. And so, um, I mean, half the controls in Frontier are running on pneumatic air. Um, air pressure controls rather than electronic for heating and whatnot. So this is going to allow us to finish those projects and then also um, the HVAC in the, in the library that needs to be improved and better insulated and so on and so forth. So yes, they, we're going to look for any, any ways to bring these costs down as we approach each project within this. So there's a, it's a series of, there's several projects as you look through the list there. Uh, Scott? Uh, Aaron, to your, to your point, uh, well taken. The uh, working group that's been at this for a couple of years now wanted to ensure that uh, it simply wasn't a debt authorization uh, with a debt authorization that didn't make any sense. There are other funding sources, as you mentioned, whether it's green communities or Department of Energy, whatever, uh, that were uh, discussed. Also, the life cycle of some of the things on the grand list uh, really have questionable borrowing returns. So one of the facets of the capital improvement plan at Frontier is grants. One is debt. We may well see articles, warrant article requests in the future, like we did last year. And as the superintendent pointed out, some use of E&D money uh, to put a mosaic together that funds uh, a living capital plan as opposed to a 21-year borrowing authorization where we all fall down and ask a billion questions. So, thanks for that. All right, anyone else? Steve? Steve Benjamin, South Main Street. In the handout that I picked up on the table, it mentioned replacing rubber roofs, and in the article itself, it mentions roof repairs. Is both happening? You're replacing, repairing? If you could explain that to me. I thought you had two mics at the beginning of the night. <laughs> oh, the other one ran out. Frontier, Frontier Regional is a roof system. Um, there's, there's rubber flats, 
and then there's also metal slants. <laughs> Um, so I'm not in the roofing business. Um, so the, there are several rubber flat areas that will have to be completely replaced and other areas that will have to be repaired. So it's repair and replace the different areas of roof, um, different structures. Because basically if you look at the Frontier's roof, it's basically they're separate roof structures. And so that's what that is. Anyone else? All right. So this is a majority vote since we're just giving them permission to borrow, essentially. So we don't need to do a two-thirds, which is what's used when you're authorizing. You're the body doing the authorizing to borrow. So we just need a majority vote on this. So all in favor of Article 13, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Uh, declare it unanimous. Number 14, please. Moderate, I'd like to move Article 14. Second. All right, this is a uh, chief of police. Is the chief here? You want to say a word or two, chief? Mr. Moderator, if I may, please. Ba basically, the chief has decided that he's not going to be available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. So he just wants to be able to uh, allow someone on his staff when he's not here to uh, designate that person to uh, uh, sign out the permit and uh, do the paperwork. Almost verbatim what I was going to say. Thank you. Good. You can repeat it if you want, but okay. In the, in the, in the past two and a half years I've been here, there have been a few times where people have come in to get a uh, permit, and I have not been here, whether it be for a training or I was out with the family. So that precluded those people from getting that uh, because following the uh, letter of the law for the bylaw, only I could approve that. So I wanted to add the words his or her designee. So if they get rid of me or if I leave, then you know, whoever they hire will still be able to pass out permits. Seems reasonable. Any other questions on this? Bruce? This article, I think, the chief makes sense to be his designee, but this whole thing about whether they determine whether the person's suitable to have a tag sale or not, you know, I think maybe we ought to look into just doing away with this completely. Um, does it produce any revenue for the town? And have, have we seen any problems with tag sales in town of an unsuitable person running one? Depends on what your definition of unsuitable is. The only issues that we have found are people doing it without the permit, therefore not allowing revenue coming to the town. Because there is a $300 fine. We choose not to fine them and rather work with our neighbors, but um, the idea is to, to have it on track so we don't just have tag sales happening all the time. Do you have a policy and procedure to determine whether people are suitable or not? I, I personally think we should just do away with this whole bylaw. I believe that the suitability is not based on whether the person is an uh, a upstanding citizen. It's about whether or not they're having numerous tax sales all the time and certain types of materials being sold on property that should not have them, like certain apartments or certain uh, duplexes don't have the square footage to ha allow uh, the uh, surplus of people stopping to go visit. So that's, what, that's the whole purpose of, purpose of having the uh, bylaw. Okay. Jay? Go chase that mic, Jay. Thank you. Uh, Jay Bowderman, uh, Silver Lane in Sunderland. And um, I've lived here for 20 years, but uh, the previous 20 years I lived in Northampton. And we ran into a problem with tag sales because there were people that kept the tables where they were and had a tag sale every week every week so I am in favor of not changing or dropping the law for that purpose the definition between a flea market and a tag sale exactly anyone else any other questions on 14 okay all those in favor of passing article 14 please say aye Opposed? Declare unanimous. 
15. I'd like to move Article 15, Mr. Moderator. Second. This is submitted by the Planning Board. Is there any explanation? Dana? None. <laughs> We're putting people in all corners of the room just to keep you. I'm Dana Roscoe from the Planning Board. Uh, other members of the Planning Board who happen to be here also tonight are Sarah Snyder, Steve Snyder, uh, and Jess Wisman. Um, Dan Murphy was also a member of the Planning Board who has stepped down, uh, and we certainly thank him. Uh, the issue that we're talking about tonight is um, affordable housing. Uh, as we know, uh, from the Sugarbush Meadows development, uh, if a municipality doesn't have 10% of their housing, sto housing stock designated as affordable, th that community, like Sunderland, is susceptible to a 40B development where a developer can come in and ignore all local bylaws and build a development that will uh, provide affordable housing, which is what happened to us. So with those 150 units that are going in uh, uh, across from Grampy's, uh, we will still not have achieved our 10%. So what we're trying to do here uh, is provide a few more carrots for uh, future developers. Uh, so if we look um, the, the changes themselves are, are like 40 or 50 pages, which I have not uh, shared with you. Um, I provided uh, just the, the summer sheet in the back, and I'll go over it now. Um, the, uh, we're, we're making uh, changes to three uh, sections, the flexible development, the major residential development, and the planned unit development. So I've, I've been on the board for about 20 years, maybe a little more than 20 years. Um, and in those 20 years, um, we have not entertained any applications for a flexible development, a major residential development, or a planned unit development. In the event that we were to see one of those, what we're trying to do here is encourage future development to include affordable housing so we can make that 10% goal. You, you not only need to make it as the, as the community grows, you need to keep up with it. So uh, if 10 more single family houses are built in, in a municipality, then uh, you need uh, a percentage, your, your, your percentage of affordable is gonna go up. So, we are uh, just, just trying to promote uh, uh, or, or give reasons for a, for a future developer uh, to include uh, affordable units in future developments, whether it be a flexible development, a major residential development, or a planned unit development. So each of those three, and it would be up to the developer to decide whether he's going to, the difference between a, uh, a major, major development, major residential development, flexible development is same number of units, but with the flexible development, you're allowed to keep your uh, building envelope uh, uh, tighter and have more open space. So you're getting the same number of units, whether you go flexible or major. Uh, you just, the, the layout of the parcel would be different. Uh, planned unit development, we're, we're basically looking more uh, at integrating uh, commercial and residential, where we have uh, commercial development on the uh, lower level uh, and residential development above. So uh, that the, that's the... Uh, the, I, I would say that's the majority of uh, the, the changes 
that we've looked at uh, in promoting affordable housing. If we flip the sheet over, we did a couple other things um, with this bylaw change. Um, we are proposing to remove uh, the development rate uh, limitation section. That's something that we instituted in 1990, I believe. It's, it's permitted as a short-term fix uh, if a community is experiencing a lot of uh, development. Uh, you can impose a, a building permit limitation for a finite period. So I, I think our limitation was 10 units. Uh, so if more than 10 applicants came to construct a single family house in a single year, the 11th one uh, would not be permitted. We never reached that uh, ceiling. Um, we we uh, expected that um, growth was going to exceed that, and it never did. But uh, what the what the court says in this uh, Zuckerman versus Town of Hadley is that it can't be uh, a permanent solution. It can be just a temporary uh, way uh, to get you through until you have uh, a bylaw to address the issue. So. We're, we're, we're proposing that we get rid of it since uh, we don't believe it's legal anymore. Uh, finally, um, we're proposing to add um, an accessory dwelling unit section. So an accessory dwelling unit would be virtually a mother-in-law apartment. So it would be limited to 800 square feet uh, it would require that uh, the owner of the property uh, be the owner of the property, that the owner of the property uh, register with the building inspector and, and attest to their uh, ownership of the property, and in the event that the owner were to no longer own the property, uh, that ADU permit would cease. So the, the, the ADU can only be in existence in an owner-occupied uh, unit of 800 square feet or less. Uh, so, so basically today, if I want to take my single-family house and make it a two-family house, I am required to have one and a half times as much land uh, as, as a single family house. And so that, that puts a restriction on some individuals with smaller lots that want to have, say, a mother-in-law apartment or, or, uh, or some other relative uh, living independently on the same property, uh, uh, not uh, every lot in town can accommodate that. These changes required um, a public hearing. That public hearing happened uh, on April 9th. Um, at the public hearing, I would say the, all of the discussion centered on this ADU pr provision. And the concern raised had to do with units that uh, are on septic systems. So when a septic system is permitted, it's permitted for uh, a, a dwelling of a certain size, a certain number of, uh, of bedrooms. And if an ADU were proposed that would add two bedrooms, the question put to the board was, would the septic system support that, those additional units? Um, in attempt to address that, um, in red, on the back of the sheet, what we had proposed was language that said, ADU may only be appro approved subject to obtaining any required approval from Board of Health, including compliance with State Sanitary Code 310 CMR 15 Title V for septic systems where applicable. 
that was our um, uh, attempt uh, to deal with the issue that was raised and I don't know if we've accomplished it with that language. So I'll just leave it at that and um. Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you, Nathaniel Waring. Um, two questions on this. The first one is what is defined as affordable housing in Sunderland and does that change over time? Uh, and the second question has to do with the, the you said that if the owner occupied ADU moves out, that that agreement goes away. Does that mean that they are no longer able to have somebody living in that, that building? The building no longer is occupiable? Or does that mean that the, the new owner has to treat it all as one building? Right. So the first question had to do with affordable housing. Um, and and it's, um, it really troubles me um, that over 50% um, of the housing stock in the town of Sunderland is rental, uh, and yet we do not comply with uh, the affordable housing laws, and that we're paying $28 million of state money to build 150 new units, every one of which will cost more than any existing unit in town. Those are affordable. The 50% we currently have are not affordable. It, it, it frustrates me, <laughs> but the, 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 state, the state determines what is affordable and, and the, the, their definition of affordable is that it carries with the unit uh, and uh, they certify the uh, user of that property as uh, income eligible. Your second question was, Right. So I, I convert my garage uh, to a mother-in-law apartment. I move. The next owner can either um, agree to, to be owner-occupied and continue to use that um, and, and certify that with the building inspector, or the use would no longer be allowed. Yeah, Bruce. Do you still need one and a half times the size of the lot to do an ADU, or is that just for, so you don't no, need that? No additional, no additional lands. No additional lands. That's only for a two-family house that you would need that. Okay, thank you. Yes. Hi, I'm Phyllis Berman from North Plain Road, and I was actually... Speak right into the top of the mic. Okay. I, this, can I sit? All right. Um, I'm Phyllis Berman from North Plain Road, and I'm actually the one who brought up the septic to the, um, to the planning board at their hearing. And I have a, um issue with even adding the, the bonus from the adding bonus you um, to something that isn't absolutely specified as being compliant with Title V. Um, there are septic systems that will comply. You don't um, have any language in your, and I did read the entire thing that you had. There isn't enough strong language in there to say that you have to. So if a uh, if a developer buys a piece of land based on, okay, I'm going to give you your 40B and I'm going to get 25% more units to be able to put in that land, say strong enough that it has to have a septic system that complies with that. Um, the other thing about um, the mother-in-law apartments, which you, you're not saying it isn't just a mother-in-law apartment. You can have like a two-bedroom. It, it's you have a size. You can. Have, is this better? No. See, it's me. <laughs> um, it's not just a mother-in-law apartment. You're. You said it can be rented to anyone. It's not just like a, a single bedroom. It could be two bedrooms, 
and you could rent it to a family, which is four people, and all of a sudden in the middle of a neighborhood, you've got, um, I'm going to make my garage into um, a, an apartment for four people that don't have to be related. And again, the septic system on that land may not even comply with just the single family house. The other wording in, in your document, it says things like, um, it has to look like a single family house, right? Yes? It has to, it doesn't, okay, what does a single family house look like? It's, you know, um, it, it also doesn't say when it's, an, when it's existing property, how long it is for existing property, but again, my major thing is the septic system, which is dependent on the size of the lot. So I feel bad for people whose lots are too small, but for the betterment of the groundwater and the wetlands and everything else, that's just the way it is and it shouldn't be changed. And that's all I have to say about septic system. And I have talked to the EPA and the um, uh, Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. Ultimately, it might be better if we looked at these sections separately for voting purposes, but I'll leave that up to the Speak rest of the folks. Speak into the mic. Top. Uh, ultimately, it may be better if we leave, if we vote on these things, areas separately, perhaps, but that's up to the, the group here. I want to talk about the uh, accessory building proposal. Um, and I know the planning board uh, because we were at the hearing, put a lot of time into this, and that their intention uh, is really a good intention. But I think the uh, consequences are, are not under control and are not perhaps what they were thinking. They have acknowledged that th even though this is a plan, this proposed accessory building that's going to greatly or potentially greatly increase the number of rental units in town, they will have no effect on 40B. It doesn't help at all. So those of us who are thinking, perhaps, gee, there's some upside here, that's not it. The proposal would, in fact, change the character of neighborhoods by allowing people to put a second dwelling unit, a small house, on their lot. The purpose however well-intentioned, is then supposedly going to be in perpetuity. That is that forever and ever, whoever does this has got to live there. It wasn't enforceable when the town tried to do it on duplexes. Because the original plan allowing duplexes in town was it's got to be owner-occupied. That was unenforceable. It was later found to be illegal. But it was certainly unenforceable as this would be. The, the bylaw would require that one maintain the appearance of single unit dwellings. It thereby recognizes the value of the appearance of our neighborhoods, things we've all worked hard to accomplish, to realize, and to maintain. But it requires who decides what the appearance is correctly. There is a, a provision for per making sure that whoever has one of these has to have a side or rear entrance. Who gets to decide or define that? That's also uh, could be changed by the, uh, the Board of Appeals, so it's not permanent. But now you've suddenly got two houses where you had one before. That's a, certainly a change in the neighborhood. Also, the, an item that came up at the hearing was You've got to have separate parking and driveways. You have to have parking and driveways that are um, 
suitable to provide services for the number of people. You're going to end up with, let's say you have a house with two bedrooms in it, and you have a septic for that. You put in your little 800-footer with two bedrooms in it. You now need septic for four because the bedrooms is what determines the size of your septic system. You're going to be putting suddenly two septic systems on that lot, some other kind of septic system. There was talk of limiting this at this time just to dwellings, uh, lots that are on town sewer. That proposal was not made, however. You all set? Yeah, that's basically it. I mean, um, I, I'm not sure also that the 800-foot little dwelling unit, you can 20 years from now tell somebody they can't put an addition on it. And this notion that this is all in perpetuity, I, I, don't, I don't think it solves any problems. It, it raises all kinds of problems. It's going to, I can't imagine it enhancing anyone's property value. I can very much imagine it hurting. That's it. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Craig? I think why I was confused here at first is the terminology for this as a mother-in-law's unit. I think that's a misnomer. That implies that it is a family member who is going to live in this unit. Now we hear that it doesn't have to be. Someone else can move into this unit, unrelated, and it makes it into a duplex. Uh, that's not the same thing as a mother-in-law or, forgive me, a father-in-law unit. Uh, we're changing the whole nature of that structure. We're putting a two-family dwelling, perhaps, as one on the same smaller lot that was meant for a one-family unit. So I would agree with the suggestion that this last part be removed from the motion and that we consider each one of these separate or if the assembled body here agrees uh, just delete the last one and vote on that separately vote on the first ones and then vote on that last one separately because there's a serious problem with this last one in the way the language has been given to us Okay, thank you. May I move this? Bruce has one comment. I'd like to suggest that we leave the article the way it is. I, I think they've put a lot of thought into it. They've had public hearings on it. Um, I've lived in neighborhoods where there's been duplexes living right next to me, um, and it's, there's no problem with it. It all depends upon who the landlords are and who owns the property and if they take care of it. And also, this is going to help a lot of elderly people in town or people that are getting older that can't afford the things in Sunderland, can't afford the taxes, and they might want to make a little extra income by renting out a, a, a one-bedroom apartment or a small two-bedroom apartment. And I think if you look at Main Street, there's a lot of residences on Main Street that are multifamily or two-family houses, and I, I don't hear any problems about those. And... I, I think this is a positive thing to move the town forward. It's very expensive to live in Sunderland, to afford a house. For our town workers and our teachers and everything else, it's expensive. And this can help people out and get more people in a community that are going to be vibrant and make it a vibrant community. The point being that we're not talking about one street or two streets. We're talking about the entire town. And we have passed over the years the size of lots the si uh, and the nature of building. So I would like to move an amendment to this that we vote on the first several down to add accessory dwelling unit section and then we take that item up separately. That is what I have moved. 
So clarify exactly what you're trying to do here, Craig. Moving it down to where? That we have a, an amendment that we... Craig, you're going to need to do your motion in writing. And According to the clerk. When would that occur? Do you want to delay the... Now. now. Do you want to delay this then while yeah, I... Yeah, just write, just write your motion down. Give me the time to write it and I will. And we'll give you the paper too. And the pen. There's a pen. Just in case you guys know out there, sometimes we may look distracted up here, but we can't hear. Um, so if, if we're turning to one another, it's because we can't hear what's being said. You can hear really well what's on the microphones. We can't. Uh, it just sounds like it's, it's mumbled. So it's not inattention. It's just trying to understand what's being said. We kind, I think we need to work with our people, with Chris again. We had a microphone or a speaker behind here, but what it does is it gets feedback into these microphones, which causes problems. So, It's like you're listening to Peanuts' parents all night. Yeah, yeah that's actually right. Article 15 to remove what is it? this add accessory dwelling unit section. Yeah. He wants to remove this piece. Yeah. Oh, what's that? Motion to divide? Okay. I think Bob, Bob uh, Doobie was moderator for how many years? I never had to look at this book. No, it's not in it. No, I, we, we never had a. <laughs> this is a motion to divide, which is on hold. So, so right now. I didn't we, practice this one. We, 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 yeah, we, didn't, we haven't practiced one, this one, Mike. So, so you want to read it, Michael? We have a motion to divide. Okay. Here we go. I'm going to have a sip of water for this one. <laughs> what are you doing to us? Okay, so this is a motion to divide. It's I move the question be divided as follows. Basically, if, limited ADUs. If I can read Craig's writing. He wants to remove the... Motion to... Well, he has a men. Divide Article 15 to read one or more sections, proposed Section 123, Article 10 4. Accessory, yeah, accessory dwelling unit. Okay. okay, so this is move the question to be divided as followed. So move to amend Article. 15 so would it be safe to say that you wanted to you want to divide the article all after add accessory dwelling unit section would that be easier into two sections the first section being down to add accessory dwelling unit section, yeah. and then having that as a second part. You want separate so, articles. So they would become separate, that we could vote on the first group and then the second one. Okay. 
So where is he going to then? He would, all, all, he wants to separate the two. All up to uh, add accessory dwelling units would be one. Yeah. And then after that, the add accessory development would be a second article. So the motion is a majority motion. Okay. okay. Each of the two parts will be two thirds. Yeah. So where? Where is it? Mark it on here. Okay. <laughs> Good practice, Craig. Good practice. So, so he want, we're, we're basically he's gonna, he wants to create two motions. Okay, one is all inclusive up to add accessory dwelling units, okay. and then add accessory dwelling units would be a, a second motion, okay. a separate motion. That's one, and this would be two. Yes. Yeah. Okay. 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 There you go. You get me my book. You get your book, man. I don't. <laughs> Thank you. We got it figured out. So up to one, two, three. It's. <laughs> my page is different than yours. Okay. Okay. That was a good one. Okay. So here we go. Got to do it the right way. So we're going to make two separate questions out of this. Still a hand up, Mr. Yeah. What, what, but he has a motion on the floor. Oh, he can't. He can't get to you yet. So he'll be back to you. Okay, so we're going to divide the question. And... We're going to vote on it. You have to vote on it. Vote on it. We're going to vote on it to divide it. Oh, okay. To divide the question. Okay. All those in favor of dividing the question... Please say aye. aye. Those opposed say nay. Nay. I would say the nays have it. Or they're noisier, one or the other. So then we're going to vote the article as presented, Article 15. Okay. So all those in favor of dividing question 15, please stand. Stay standing. Hold, hold on, maintain your positions. Stretch, do some stretches.
I thought we were in the clear. The nine, the nine o'clock. So after this vote, you can uh, remember that you get the Daniel Hanks arm up, okay? The guy with the oh, yeah, the blue hat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Are we good? Okay? Okay, those opposed, please sit down. Those opposed to dividing the question, please stand up. All right. Okay. 47 in favor and 34. 47 for, 34 against. Okay, so we will divide the question. You had a question? Uh, in terms of um, taxes, is the, the, if you, they build the 800 square foot second, second building on the property, that raises their property taxes for the, the unit because the whole property is now worth more. There's, other, there's more building on it. What happens to that property taxes if they sell the property, the new owner comes in, chooses not to occupy that? Is that still taxable occupied space or does that go back to being in a different tax vein? Did you hear that? Uh, we have to be honest, we didn't fully hear the question up here. Um, in terms of taxes, if somebody builds one of these 800 square foot second houses on their property, that makes their property more valuable, so their, their property taxes will go up. Will that maintain at the new level, even if they no longer occupy that residence later on, if, they, if, they, if a new owner comes in, chooses not to use that as an occupied thing, you know, just leaves it vacant, does that still, is that still taxable for the town or does that go back to being untaxable? What do you think? It's an assessor question, really. There's a realtor. You get that? Okay. So now we're dividing this question, so we have to, I have to figure this one out. So we'll vote on the first part. Um, which I think I should probably read. Okay. So this is, this is what the article Dividing it, we'll turn this into uh, the first part of the article. Move that the town vote to amend Chapter 125 of the Code of Sunderland Zoning Bylaws, Section 125, Article 1-2, Definitions. Section 125, Article 2-2, two, two, Use Regulations. Section 125, Article 4-1, Flexible Development.
Section 125, Article 4-2, Major Residential Development, and Section Article 4-3, Plan Unit Development, Overlay District. This, there is one section proposed for deletion, Section 124, Article 4-4, Development Rate Limitation, and one new section proposed. Whoops. That's right. Stop before that. Up to limita up to limitation. Any qu any questions on that? Is that clear as mud? Better than that. Next year, hopefully, we're going to have a throw toss microphone. So practice up. So next year, we'll just toss the microphone. It'll be a big, fluffy thing, and you guys will be able to catch it. It's a good thing our attorney is here, so again, when the injuries start. Right? <laughs> we will have liability insurance through my, of course. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes. Uh, I guess it would be a point of order. Can we vote on something that doesn't refer to the specific language, doesn't include the specific language, and doesn't refer to the specific language where it is? Is that a legal vote? I mean, we're voting on something that says this provides a greater incentive to include a four. I mean, this, that's an editorial comment. <clears throat> I mean, I know the planning board has prepared a document that includes these changes. Shouldn't we be voting on that? Okay. Okay. Okay, so we have a motion on the floor. So we need to vote on the what I read to you is what we're voting on. So it goes, if you have it in front of you, it goes up into um, just before section 123. So it's the first kind of 80% of the language is what we're voting on. All right? So all those in favor of Article 15 as read, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed? I, re I say that's a majority. Ah, I declare it two thirds majority. So, do we want to deal with the second half? Okay. 
So now the last motion um, is going to be the second half of that article. So it will be from section 123, article 4-4, accessory dwelling units. So we need to put this in the form of another motion. Um, Okay, so this is going to be an article. Um, this will move that we add the accessory, de accessory dwelling section. Um, I guess that's it. Okay. So all those in favor. Any questions? So it, you know, this just kind of everything is intertwined here, and I don't want to rush to a vote that that is going to be procedurally illegal. Um, there, there's a new definition, so the definitions changes. There's a new use in the use table, so the use table changes. And there's a new section of the bylaw. So there's, there's really three components of the ADU. And it must be clear that we're voting on all three, that we're, that we're adding a definition, that we're changing the use table, and that we're adding an ADU section. All three of those things are, are what's on the table here. OK. Can you specify what they are, Dana? Right. Saying what an accessory dwelling unit is? So, under the definition section, accessory dwelling unit, a self contained dwelling unit incorporated within detached single family dwelling or within an accessory structure that is subordinate in size to the single family dwelling in a manner that maintains the appearance of the structure as a single family dwelling. So, that's the definition. Is this debatable? Okay, so it's not debatable. Okay, it's already, oh, okay, it's okay, already okay, been passed. Okay, okay, it's already been passed. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You, you mean the definition has been passed? Yes. No. Right, not the definition, but the first part. Because if that hasn't been passed, then we could discuss it. Yes, we did pass the definition. Article 1-2. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of money. Mr. Moderator, I'd like to make a motion to reconsider this uh, article, please. Article 15. Isn't there a motion? The motion to reconsider the article. Second. The whole article in its entirety. Okay, so that means that a two thirds vote means that we'll do the vote over again. So we need to vote on Tom's motion. So all those in favor, you want to repeat the motion? Uh, what 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 reconsideration means? I'd, I'd like to reconsider the motion that was just passed. That will get us back to the beginning. I'd like I'd I, at that point I'd like to table the motion so that it could be more fully discussed in in Understood. additional meetings with the planning board and then be brought back before us again. That's I I think right. 
if I, I'm, I'm, con I'm a little confused, and I don't think zoning bylaws should be passed if there's confusion amongst the people on, on how it's done. So we, so we need to reconsider because there's a motion on the floor, and it takes a two-thirds vote to, to reconsider. So all those in favor? There was a motion on the floor to, con we, we voted on Part A. You declared it was two-thirds majority on Part A. We moved on to Part B. There was a motion, there was a second on Part B, and now you're entertaining a different motion to reconsider when there was a motion and a second on the floor to vote on Part B. Point of order. So I'll Okay, okay. Okay, so we're going to take a vote on the motion, which is, that's on the floor, and we'll, we'll go back and I'll tell you what that was. <laughs> if I can find it. Okay, which is, the motion on the floor was to move that we add the accessory uh, dwelling units. Correct? Okay, so that's the, that's the motion that's on the floor. So this is a two-thirds vote. So all those in favor of the motion to add accessory dwelling units say aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. Nay. It's a two-thirds. I think we probably ought to do a standing vote, okay? So please stand if you were in favor of this. Don't you wish you were up here? <laughs> Okay. Okay, please sit. Tho those opposed, please stand. Okay. Thank you. It didn't pass. It did not two thirds. That's not two thirds. Okay, so here are the results. It did not pass. 
39 yeses, 36 nays. So now what do you want to do? Do you want to reconsider? Okay. Article 16. Wait, what? I thought there was a separate motion to reconsider. As a moderator at this time, I'd like to move the no, Article 16. We couldn't Second. Do Mr. Moderator, at this time, I move that this matter be postponed indefinitely. Second. There's a motion on the floor to indefinitely postpone Article 16. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, nay. Passes unanimously. Moderator, I'd like to move Article 17. Second. You have any explanation on Article 17? Mr. Mo Mr. Moderator. Um, we, we had a uh, group of residents that came to the board and asked that we consider changing the board's official name from Board of, Select Mo board of Selectmen to Select Board to be all-inclusive. And unfortunately, the way we have to do things is we have to petition the state legislators to ask them if it's okay to do so. That's why we're coming to town meeting to do that. Okay. Any other questions, comments? Yes. My name is Ellie Kurth. Can you hear me? Yep. I live on Russell Street, and I'm one of the residents who came to the, select, the Board of Selectmen and suggested that we look into changing the name to be a name that's more inclusive of all the residents in Sunderland. Um, and I want to thank the, select, or the Board of Selectmen for putting together. I'm not doing that on purpose, honestly. Um, <laughs> um, so anyway, I appreciate them putting this on the town meeting warrant. Anyone else have a comment or question? Article 17. All right. So we're going to vote on Article 17. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. Declare it unanimous. Thank goodness. All right. Article 18. Explanation. Mr. Moderator, this is a series of small changes to the charge of the Capital Improvement Committee. Uh, one of them is composition. The original bylaw as um, adopted had a specific list of participants, finance committee member, planning board member, library trustees member, members at large. We'd like to change that to have at least four but not more than eight members, uh, town administrator being one non-voting member. Secondly, we'd like to change a couple of pieces of the language. Uh, one is around uh, at least as opposed to over $10,000. And another is uh, transmitting our information. It's about reporting to this body as well as to the Board of Selectmen. And lastly, um, lastly, it is a repository of our report uh, being sent to town meeting. So these three areas are streamlining a little bit of the clunkiness of the original law, original bylaw, excuse me. There's no significant changes to the task. There are no changes to the task, and there are only changes to a reporting function as well as to the composition being more volunteer, more appointed as opposed to pillaging from other boards and committees, which by the end of the year, everybody's on a board and committee is usually on seven or eight. 
Okay, any other questions, comments on Article 18? Sarah? Tiny little editorial. You missed one Board of Select Minutes in uh, C1. You need to change one last. In C1, the third line, the report, it still says the report shall be submitted to the Board of Selectmen. It needs to be changed to Select Board as it was throughout the rest of the. Change. So is that considered an amendment? That would be an amendment. Okay, so we need to vote on the change. Um, so all those, this is on uh, in C section one. There's still one line that was not changed, which says board of selectmen. So this is to change that line to select board. All those in favor of this amendment, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. Declare that unanimous. Now we'll vote on the entire article. Article 18, this is a change to um, the Code of Sunderland, so it's a two-thirds vote. So all those in favor of Article 18 as amended, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, nay. Declare it unanimous. Article 19. 19, please. Second. Discussion on Article 19. Susan. Susan Triolo, Garage Road. Um, when you all came in, you may have um, picked up a copy of this about changing the Massachusetts state seal and the state flag. If you didn't, there's a huge pile of them on the back table so you can actually see what this is about and the importance of it. We all know symbols are important. The American flag, the Statue of Liberty, monuments in our nation's capital um, of Lincoln and Jefferson. These powerful symbols mean something to us as a people, as a nation. Perhaps you, like I, never thought much about or even looked closely at the symbolism of the Massachusetts state flag and seal that represents our state and represents we who live in this state. I never really noticed there's a colonial broadsword held over the head of a Native American man. I never noticed the downward pointing arrow held in his hand indicating not peace, but pacification. Perhaps, like you, I never really thought about the Massachusetts flag and seal placed prominently on auditorium stages in our schools, on all state vehicles and official papers, even maybe the flag that's not visible on the stage. Um, both native children and children of all races view, study, and absorb this warlike imagery and its implied subjugation of native people. 400 years ago, in 1620, the Wampanoag peoples welcomed the white European settlers and helped them to survive the first harsh winters in North America. Senator Joe Comerford spoke at a recent Greenfield City Council meeting, and she said, as we approach this important anniversary, 400 years after the first white settlers, we have the opportunity to consider our history and to come together as one and say, it is time to change the Massachusetts flag and seal. She said, and I agree, we need a new official state symbol that reflects the connection we want between all people who share the Commonwealth today in the shared awareness of the truths of our past in hope of justice and peace in the years to come. I ask that you vote yes on this warrant article. Eight other towns have passed resolutions and more than 10 communities across the Commonwealth will vote to support this legislation this year. The legislation supported by Senator Joe Comerford and Rep. Natalie Blay are among 35 other legislators co-sponsoring 
House Resolution 2776 and Senate Resolution 1877. This legislation has actually been in the works for about 35 years. It will set up a commission where native leaders from Massachusetts will be invited to sit with state legislators to design a new state flag and seal. I urge you to vote yes to begin to create a new official symbol that represents our best selves and the true spirit and values of our Commonwealth. Thank you. Any, any other discussion or questions on Article 19? Mike. Bruce. I'd like to know if they have an estimate of what it's going to cost the Commonwealth or the taxpayers to do all these changes and what particularly is the cost going to be to the town? I would estimate it's going to be substantial, and we have trouble educating our kids. I, I kind of agree with you, but this should be put on the back burner and try to figure out how we can educate our children better and raise money for that. I would imagine that it's going to be less than the damage done to the native peoples that are in question here, and that the, this is a small move that the Commonwealth can do to, to help make uh, past injustices right. Scott. This, I'm Scott Reed. Uh, this is just setting up a commission to study the, the redesign of the flag and seal. The cost of a commission, uh, you can tell me what the cost of a commission might be, but it's not going to be some, a cost to the town for them to consider redesigning the flag and seal. It's some people getting together and having meetings. Anyone else? Will? Do I? Okay. Uh, Will Sill on South Main Street. Um, part of the, uh, the motion that's uh, on the floor includes changing the motto. And the motto is touched on on the handout, but not completely. Uh, we've had the motto uh, for over some 200 some odd years. And what I would like to propose, and I'll explain why, is I'd ask the petitioners to delete and motto from the motion and then go on and discuss the changing the seal. Whether the seal includes the motto or not, I don't, you know, I'm not taking a position, but I don't want the motto to change. The motto um, means, I'm not going to try to, you know, you take English written in the 17th century, translate it into Latin, and then translate it back to English. Basically what the motto says is that the only true peace is one where you are free. You have your liberty. If you don't have your liberty, you don't really have peace. And that we care so much about our liberty that we will fight for it. That's basically what the motto says. We call ourselves the cradle of liberty, uh, and you know a lot of people have died to defend it, and I would just like to see the motto left alone and removed from the article. Thank you very much. Any other comment? Uh, I'd just like to remind everybody that this is only a motion to resolve to support a state commission that we would not be specifically involved. This would be to support Representative Blay and Senator Comerford continuing their advocacy. This is not something, it, this is a commission that we, we can't change the, the proposals that they've made already so without contacting them. So that is information on the content of this is something that we should contact the representatives about. We're only making a recommendation of whether we're going to move to support them or not. Will. Um, I, I asked uh, earlier of the moderator uh, whether or not it would be possible to amend this article at town meeting and I've been told that it is possible to amend the article. I'm not going to amend it. I'm asking the petitioners to do that. Uh, so I think you can. Anyone else? Susan? The um, translation of the entire motto 
is by the sword we seek peace, but peace only under liberty. Um, by the sword we seek peace, as a, as a person who, um, I consider myself a peacemaker as opposed to a war maker, um, seeking peace um, by the sword is an oxymoron in my opinion. But um, as has been said, um, and as we are proposing, this is a commission to explore this. Um, and we are living, in, in my opinion, in a time when we need to look at how we, the symbols that represent us. And I urge people, even if this is voted, whichever way you decide to vote, I urge you to pick up a copy of this on the back table so that you are closely looking at the symbol that is representing our state. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Oh, I'd just like to reiterate what our, um, the head of our, of our finance committee said, that changing the wording of what we say in this is, would be paramount to supporting something that doesn't exist. What we're talking about is supporting something that already has wording, already, has, already exists, and it's, it's like saying that well, you know, no, I don't support that, so I'm going to say something different that has zero effect on anything. Um, this is not us saying we support this. What this is saying is we are supporting the already existing efforts of Natalie Blay and Joe Comerford. Sarah? Just agreed that the word motto is in quotes. It's not, we can't change a quote. Okay, so do you want to make a motion, Will? As much as I would like to support uh, the idea of reconsidering the seal, if the motto is included as something that we're going to change, I think it's a big mistake. When the citizens tell their legislators and the world at large that we think so little of our liberty, that we no longer want to defend it. We send a terrible message. And we send a terrible message to other people around the world who will hear it, who seek liberty. Okay, so we're gonna vote on Article 19. Okay? All those in favor of Article 19, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. I declare the nays have it. I'll count. Everybody, if you disagree with the moderators, seven of you have to disagree and you get a count. Just raise your hand and say, I disagree. It's, it's simple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's we called a rule. Okay, counselor is ready. All those in favor of Article 19, please stand. I'm into my I'm into my reserved beverage up here now. No, that's why you got to come You got to we're getting there. We're doing so well at the beginning. Are you good? I think we're on Act 19, but I'm not sure. We might still be back in 15. <laughs> All right, you can sit. 
Those opposed to Article 19, please stand. Those opposed to Article 19, please stand. How can that be so far off? I was way off on that one. I told you we can't hear anything up here. I was way off on that one, man. Shut your mic I can't. I don't have one. Every day. I keep wondering why they keep sending them to me. Are you good? So, I stand corrected. That was the vocal minority. <laughs> Forty-seven to seventeen. <laughs> Article nineteen passes it. All right. He didn't hear very well. Bob had good, maybe Bob had good hearing. I don't know. Um, okay. Article twenty. Uh, explanation, Article 20? We need a second. second. You had one. So, Mr. Moderator, this is uh, cons this article here is specific to construction microphone. easements. Microphone, Scott. Sorry. Mic Sorry. Sorry, microphone. Uh, this article is specific to construction easements for the reconstruction of North Main Street. This is not a land take in any way, shape, or form, but it allows for the town to go forward with that construction, things like parking of vehicles, on-site, you know, et cetera. Any questions on Article 20? Susan, short. This is way beyond my calling time, my sleeping time. So. I just, um, since you mentioned parking, are we going to have parking on 47 North? Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Article 20 is a two-thirds vote. So everyone in favor of Article 20, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed? I, I think I'll declare a two-thirds majority, just to play it safe. All right, I think we're getting through this, or I'm getting through it anyways. Um, I did ask for no's. I did, I'm covering my bases. Don't let me down now, Tom. Okay, so these are Article 21 through 26 are the consent articles, which basically allows people in town to do their tasks. Um, you, can, you can look those over. Yes. I move that we uh, vote Articles 21 through 26 as a group together. Second. All those in favor of voting Articles 21 through 26 together say aye. 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 Those opposed? Unanimous. All right. So now. <laughs> Mr. Moderator, at this time I'd like to make a motion to dissolve. Second. Second. No, we haven't voted yet. <laughs> okay, now we voted to vote this all at once. So guess what? Now we got to vote it. So <laughs> articles 21 through 26, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. I declare a majority. Okay. Mr. Moderator, I'd like to make a motion to dissolve. Second. That couldn't come fast enough. All right. 
Okay, all those in favor of dissolving this meeting, say aye. aye. Opposed? Aye. Majority. All right.